everyone, and welcome to episode 42 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. This week, I'm still a little under the weather, so I thought I'd try something new and relatively easy. I love medieval romances, especially the Arthurian ones, and I also love the Lays of Marie de France, so I thought I'd do something a little medieval and read one of Marie's stories to you aloud, as you might have heard it sometime in the late 12th century, if Marie had written it in English, that is. Marie de France, as she calls herself in her Breton stories, or Lays, is somewhat of a mystery woman believed by some to have been the Countess of Champagne, daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine. No one actually knows who she was, but she definitely calls herself Marie, making herself known in an age when not every author did. Her lays include a lot of interesting stories, and I thought hard about which one to share with you. One of them is called Bisclevre, and it's an early werewolf story. And another, called Yonek, is about a bird knight who has a romantic affair with a lady in a tower. But I picked L'Enval because it has a little bit of everything. Arthur and Gawain, of course a nasty, egotistical Guinevere, half-naked otherworldly ladies in the forest, a trial, and a dramatic ending. It's also full of really rich detail and Marie's funny asides. I hope you enjoy it. Here's the story of L'Enval by Marie de France. Just as it happened, I shall relate to you the story of another lay, which tells of a very noble young man whose name in Breton is L'Enval. Arthur, the worthy and courtly king, was at Carlisle on account of the Scots and the Picts, who were ravaging the country, penetrating into the land of Logre, and frequently laying it waste. The king was there during the summer, at Pentecost, and he gave many rich gifts to counts and barons and to those of the round table. There was no such company in the whole world. He apportioned wives and lands to all, save to one who had served him. This was L'Enval, whom he did not remember, and for whom no one put in a good word. Because of his valor, generosity, beauty, and prowess, many were envious of him. There were those who pretended to hold him in esteem, but who would not have uttered a single regret if misfortune had befallen him. He was the son of a king of noble birth, but far from his inheritance, and although he belonged to Arthur's household, he had spent all his wealth, for the king gave him nothing, and L'Enval asked for nothing. Now he was in a plight, very sad and forlorn. Lords, do not be surprised. A stranger bereft of advice can be very downcast in another land when he does not know where to seek help. This knight, whose tale I am telling you, had served the king well. One day he mounted his horse and went to take his ease. He left the town and came alone to a meadow, dismounting by the stream, but there his horse trembled violently. So he loosened its saddle girth and left it, allowing it to enter the meadow to roll over on its back. He folded his cloak, which he placed beneath his head, very disconsolate because of his troubles, and nothing could please him. Lying thus, he looked down river and saw two damsels coming, more beautiful than any he had ever seen. They were richly dressed in closely fitting tunics of dark purple, and their faces were very beautiful. The older one carried dishes of gold, well and finely made, I will not fail to tell you the truth, and the other carried a towel. They went straight to where the knight lay, and L'Enval, who was very well-mannered, stood up to meet them. They first greeted him, and then delivered their message. Sir L'Enval, my damsel, who is very worthy, wise, and fair, has sent us for you. Come with us, for we will conduct you safely. Look, her tent is near." The knight went with them, disregarding his horse which was grazing before him in the meadow. They led him to the tent which was so beautiful and well appointed that neither Queen Semiramis at the height of her wealth, power and knowledge, nor the Emperor Octavian could have afforded even the right-hand side of it. There was a golden eagle placed on the top, the value of which I cannot tell, nor of the ropes or the poles which supported the walls of the tent." There is no king under the sun who could afford it, however much he might give. Inside this tent was the maiden who surpassed in beauty the lily and the new rose when it appears in summer. She lay on a very beautiful bed. The coverlets cost as much as a castle, clad only in her shift. Her body was well formed and handsome, and in order to protect herself from the heat of the sun, she had cast about her a costly mantle of white ermine covered with Alexandrian purple. Her side, though, was uncovered, as well as her face, neck, and breast. She was whiter than the hawthorn blossom. 
The maiden called the knight, who came forward and sat before the bed. L'Enval, she said, fair friend, for you I came from my country. I have come far in search of you, and if you are worthy and courtly, no emperor, count, or king will have felt as much joy or happiness as you, for I love you above all else. He looked at her and saw that she was beautiful. Love's spark pricked him so that his heart was set alight, and he replied to her in a seemly manner. Fair lady, if it were to please you to grant me the joy of wanting to love you, you could ask nothing that I would not do as best I could, be it foolish or wise. I shall do as you bid and abandon all others for you. I never want to leave you, and this is what I most desire. When the girl heard these words from the man who loved her so, she granted him her love and her body. Now Lanval was on the right path. She gave him a boon that henceforth he could wish for nothing which he would not have, and however generously he gave or spent, she still would find enough for him. Lanval was very well lodged, for the more he spent, the more gold and silver he would have. Beloved, she said, I admonish, order, and beg you not to reveal this secret to anyone. I shall tell you the long and the short of it. You would lose me forever if this love were to become known. You would never be able to see me or possess me. He replied that he would do what she commanded. He lay down beside her on the bed. Now Lanval was well lodged. That afternoon he remained with her until evening and would have done so longer had he been able and had his love allowed him. Beloved, she said, arise, you can stay no longer. Go from here and I shall remain, but I shall tell you one thing. Whenever you wish to speak with me, you will not be able to think of a place where a man may enjoy his love without reproach or wickedness, that I shall not be there with you to do your bidding. No man save you will see me or hear my voice. When he heard this, Lanval was well pleased, and kissing her, he arose. The damsels who had led him to the tent dressed him in rich garments, and in his new clothes there was no more handsome young man on earth. He was neither foolish nor ill-mannered. The damsels gave him water to wash his hands and a towel to dry them, and then brought him food. He took his supper, which was not to be disdained, with his beloved. He was very courteously served and dined joyfully. There was one dish in abundance that pleased the knight particularly, for he often kissed his beloved and embraced her closely. When they had risen from table, his horse was brought to him well saddled. Lanval was richly served there. He took his leave, mounted, and went towards the city, often looking behind him, for he was greatly disturbed, thinking of his adventure, and uneasy in his heart. He was at a loss to know what to think, for he could not believe it was true. When he came to his lodgings, he found his men finely dressed. That night he offered lavish hospitality, but no one knew how this came to be. There was no knight in the town in sore need of shelter whom he did not summon and serve richly and well. Lanval gave costly gifts. Lanval freed prisoners. Lanval clothed the jongleur. Lanval performed many honorable acts. There was no one, stranger or friend, to whom he would not have given gifts. He experienced great joy and pleasure, for day or night he could see his beloved often, and she was entirely at his command. In the same year, I believe, after St. John's Day, as many as thirty knights had gone to relax in a garden beneath the tower where the queen was staying. Gawain was with them and his cousin, the fair Ewain. Gawain, the noble and the worthy, who endeared himself to all, said, In God's name, lords, we treat our companion Lanval ill, for he is so generous and courtly, and his father is a rich king, yet we have not brought him with us. So they returned, went to his lodgings, and persuaded him to come with them. The queen, in the company of three ladies, was reclining by a window cut out of the stone when she caught sight of the king's household and recognized Lanval. She called one of her ladies to summon her most elegant and beautiful damsels to relax with her in the garden where the others were. She took more than thirty with her, and they went down the steps where the knights, glad of their coming, came to meet them. They took the girls by the hand, and the conversation was not uncourtly. Lanval withdrew to one side, far from the others, for he was impatient to hold his beloved, to kiss, embrace, and touch her. He cared little for other people's joy when he could not have his own pleasure. When the queen saw the knight alone, she approached him straight away. Sitting down beside him, she spoke to him and opened her heart. Lanval, I have honored, cherished, and loved you much. You may have all my love. Just tell me what you desire. I grant you my love, and you should be glad to have me. 
Lady, he said, leave me be. I have no desire to love you, for I have long served the king and do not want to betray my faith. Neither you nor your love will ever lead me to wrong my lord. The queen became angry and distressed and spoke unwisely. L'enval, she said, I well believe that you do not like this kind of pleasure. I have been told often enough that you have no desire for women. You have well-trained young men and enjoy yourself with them. Base coward, wicked recreant, my lord is extremely unfortunate to have suffered you near him. I think he may have lost his salvation because of it. When he heard her, he was distressed, but not slow to reply. He said something in spite that he was often to regret. Lady, I am not skilled in the profession you mention, but I love and am loved by a lady who should be prized above all others I know, and I will tell you one thing. You can be sure that one of her servants, even the very poorest girl, is worth more than you, my lady the queen, in body, face and beauty, wisdom and goodness. Thereupon the queen left and went in tears to her chamber, very distressed and angry that he had humiliated her in this way. She took to her bed ill and said that she would never get up again unless the king saw that justice was done her in respect of her complaint. The king had returned from the woods after an extremely happy day. He entered the queen's apartments, and when she saw him, she complained aloud, fell at his feet, cried for mercy, and said Lanval had shamed her. He had requested her love, and because she had refused him, had insulted and deeply humiliated her. He had boasted of a beloved who was so well-bred, noble, and proud that her chambermaid, the poorest servant she had, was worthier than the queen. The king grew very angry, and swore on oath that if Lanval could not defend himself in court, he would have him burned or hanged. The king left the room, summoned three of his barons, and sent them for Lanval, who was suffering great pain. He had returned to his lodgings, well aware of having lost his beloved by revealing their love. Alone in his chamber, distraught and anguished, he called his beloved repeatedly, but to no avail. He lamented and sighed, fainting from time to time. A hundred times he cried to her to have mercy, to come and speak with her beloved. He cursed his heart and his mouth, and it was a wonder he did not kill himself. His cries and moans were not loud enough, nor his agitation and torment such that she would have mercy on him, or even permit him to see her. Alas, what will he do? The king's men arrived and told Lanval to go to court without delay. The king had summoned him through them, for the queen had accused him. Lanval went sorrowfully and would have been happy for them to kill him. He came before the king, sad, subdued, and silent, betraying his great sorrow. The king said to him angrily, "'Vassal, you have wronged me greatly. You were extremely ill-advised to shame and vilify me and to slander the queen.' You boasted out of folly, for your beloved must be very noble for her handmaiden to be more beautiful and more worthy than the queen. Lanval denied point by point having offended and shamed his lord, and maintained that he had not sought the queen's love, but he acknowledged the truth of his words about the love of which he had boasted. He now regretted this, for as a result he had lost her. He told them he would do whatever the court decreed in this matter. But the king was very angry, and sent for all his men to tell him exactly what he should do, so that his action would not be unfavorably interpreted. Whether they liked it or not, they obeyed his command and assembled to make a judgment, deciding that a day should be fixed for the trial, but that Lanval should provide his lord with pledges that he would await his judgment and return later to his presence. Then the court would be larger, for at that moment only the king's household itself was present. The barons returned to the king and explained their reasoning. The king asked for pledges, but Lanval was alone and forlorn, having no relation or friend there. Then Gawain approached and offered to stand bail, and all his companions did likewise. The king said to them, I entrust him to you on surety of all that you hold from me, lands and fiefs, each man separately. When this had been pledged, there was no more to be done, and Lanval returned to his lodging with the knights escorting him. They chastised him and urged him strongly not to be so sorrowful, and cursed such foolish love. They went to see him every day as they wished to know whether he was drinking and eating properly, being very much afraid that he might harm himself. On the appointed day the barons assembled. The king and queen were there, and the guarantors brought Lanval to court. They were all very sad on his account, and I think there were a hundred who would have done all in their power to have him released without a trial because he had been wrongly accused. The king demanded the verdict according to the charge and the rebuttal, and now everything lay in the hands of the barons. 
They considered their judgment very troubled and concerned on account of this noble man from abroad who was in such a plight in their midst. Some of them wanted to harm him in conformity with their lord's will. Thus spoke the Count of Cornwall. There shall be no default on our part. Like it or not, right must prevail. The king accused his vassal, whom I heard you call Lanval, of a felony, and charged him with a crime about a love he boasted of which angered my lady. Only the king is accusing him, so by the faith I owe you, there ought, to tell the truth, to be no case to answer, were it not that one should honor one's lord in all things. An oath will bind Lanval, and the king will put the matter in our hands. If he can provide proof, and his beloved comes forward, and if what he said to incur the queen's displeasure is true, then he will be pardoned, since he did not say it to spite her. And if he cannot furnish proof, then we must inform him that he will lose the king's service, and that the king must banish him. They sent word to the knight, and informed him that he should send for his beloved to defend and protect him. He told them that this was not possible, and that he would receive no help from her. The messengers returned to the judges, expecting no help to be forthcoming for Lanval. The king pressed them hard because the queen was waiting for them. When they were about to give their verdict, they saw two maidens approaching on two fine ambling palfreys. They were extremely comely and dressed only in purple taffeta next to their bare skin. The knights were pleased to see them. Gawain and three other knights went to Lanval, told them about this, and pointed the two maidens out to him. Gawain was very glad, and strongly urged Lanval to tell him if this was his beloved, but he told them that he did not know who they were, whence they came, or where they were going. The maidens continued to approach, still on horseback, and then dismounted before the dais where King Arthur was seated. They were of great beauty and spoke in courtly fashion. King, make your chambers available and hang them with silken curtains, so that my lady may stay here, for she wishes to lodge with you. This he granted them willingly, and summoned two knights who led them to the upper chambers. For the moment they said no more. The king asked his barons for the judgment and the responses, and said that they had greatly angered him by the long delay. Lord, they said, we are deliberating, but because of the ladies we saw we have not reached a verdict. Let us continue with the trial. So they assembled in some anxiety, and there was a good deal of commotion and contention. While they were in this troubled state, they saw two finely accoutred maidens coming along the street, dressed in garments of Phrygian silk and riding on Spanish mules. The vassals were glad of this, and they said to each other that Lanval, the worthy and brave, was now saved. Ewain went up to him with his companions and said, Lord, rejoice, for the love of God speak to us. Two damsels are approaching very comely and beautiful. It is surely your beloved. Lanval quickly replied that he did not recognize them, nor did he know or love them. When they had arrived, they dismounted before the king, and many praised them highly for their bodies, faces, and complexions. They were both more worthy than the queen had ever been. The older of the two, who was courtly and wise, delivered her message fittingly. King, place your chambers at our disposal for the purpose of lodging my lady. She is coming here to speak with you. He ordered them to be taken to the others who had arrived earlier. They paid no heed to their mules, and as soon as they had left the king, he summoned all his barons so that they might deliver their verdict. This had taken up too much of the day, and the queen, who had been waiting for them for such a long time, was getting angry. Just as they were about to give their verdict, a maiden on horseback entered the town. There was none more beautiful in the whole world. She was riding a white palfrey which carried her well and gently. Its neck and head were well formed, and there was no finer animal on earth. The palfrey was richly equipped, for no count or king on earth could have paid for it save by selling or pledging his lands. The lady was dressed in a white tunic and shift, laced left and right so as to reveal her sides. Her body was comely, her hips low, her neck whiter than snow on a branch. Her eyes were bright and her face white, her mouth fair and her nose well placed. Her eyebrows were brown and her brow fair and her hair curly and rather blonde. A golden thread does not shine as brightly as the rays reflected in the light from her hair. Her cloak was of dark silk, and she had wrapped its skirts about her. She held a sparrowhawk on her wrist, and behind her there followed a dog. There was no one in the town, humble or powerful, old or young, who did not watch her arrival, and no one jested about her beauty. She approached slowly, and the judges who saw her thought it was a great wonder. No one who had looked at her could have failed to be inspired with real joy. 
Those who loved the knight went and told him about the maiden who was coming and who, please God, would deliver him. Lord and friend, here comes a lady whose hair is neither tawny nor brown. She is the most beautiful of all women in the world. Lanval heard this and raised his head, for he knew her well, and sighed. His blood rushed to his face, and he was quick to speak. In faith, he said, it is my beloved. If she shows me no mercy, I hardly care if anyone should kill me, for my cure is in seeing her. The lady entered the palace, where no one so beautiful had ever before been seen. She dismounted before the king, and in the sight of all let her cloak fall so that they could see her better. The king, who was well-mannered, rose to meet her, and all the others honored her and offered themselves as her servants. When they had looked at her and praised her beauty greatly, she spoke thus, for she had no wish to remain. "'King, I have loved one of your vassals, Lanval, whom you see there. Because of what he said, he was accused in your court, and I do not wish him to come to any harm. You should know that the queen was wrong, as he never sought her love. As regards the boast he made, if he can be acquitted by me, let your barons release him.' The king granted that it should be, as the judges recommended, in accordance with justice. There was not one who did not consider that Lanval had successfully defended himself, and so he was freed by their decision. Outside the hall there was a large block of dark marble, onto which heavily armed men climbed when they left the king's court. Lanval mounted it, and when the maiden came through the door he leapt in a single bound onto the palfrey behind her. He went with her to Avalon, so the Bretons tell us, to a very beautiful island. Thither the young man was born, and no one has heard any more about him, nor can I relate any more. This translation of Laval is by Glyn S. Burgess and Keith Busby. It's from the Penguin Lays Marie de France. You can find other versions of the story in both Middle English and Old French. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Hey, I got a question for you. Do you like medieval manuscripts? I do. I really like medieval manuscripts. Well, now you can look at 160,000 pages worth of medieval manuscripts. That is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting news. Where do we find these, Peter? Well, uh, there's been a, a big project out of like Philadelphia, like universities and libraries, institutions all kind of collaborated together. So we have a news piece uh, about it, and it tells you all the different places you can go uh, to kind of check out um, like hundreds of manuscripts uh, dating back all the way to the ninth century that are now fully digitized and online. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Thanks for letting us know. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we have that, and we also have your review of uh, The Night Before Christmas. <laughs> That's right, The Night Before Christmas. <laughs> Which you enjoyed, I take it. Oh, it is your classic Christmas movie. You know, you can't be can't be the fun police about this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so we have uh, we have that on the site and a bunch more. So please check it out. <laughs> we will. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Thank you. Bye. As always, if you love the podcast and want to keep it going, why not check out our Patreon page where you can find subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and an ad-free desktop version of Medievalist.net. You can even choose to just kick in a dollar per month. All of your support is most appreciated. You can find us at patreon.com slash medievalists. More thanks go to all the people who have supported me by ordering or pre-ordering my new book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction. If you're in the UK, it's already available. If you're elsewhere in the world, you can still pre-order it from your favorite bookstore. Thank you so much to all the people who have already bought it and read it and left reviews on Amazon. Your support means the world. For all those digitized manuscripts Peter was talking about and all your favorite medieval goodness, you can follow Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thank you for listening just the way they did back in the day. Have yourself an awesome day. 